Good afternoon everyone, welcome to Our Small Footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off-grid in Australia. Uh, today's video is another canning video. I've got a bunch of canning stuff that I've been doing over the past couple of weeks to share and I keep on pushing it away. So today is another canning video and it is salsa. So we got a big box of tomatoes from the community hamper that we get. Uh, which I was super grateful because we have no tomatoes in the garden. I'm going to try and get a couple more boxes of tomatoes when I'm in uh, Brisbane for my next grocery shop in a fortnight. But uh, for the moment, this has helped out immeasurably. Now, one of the things that we tend to do with fresh tomatoes is make salsa because I find that there is a significant difference in salsa made with canned, like tin tomatoes that you buy and fresh tomatoes, whereas things like pasta sauce and that, because they're cooked so long, tin tomatoes in a pasta sauce and then canned into jars is really neither here nor there it works perfectly fine so I tend to use the tin tomatoes and jarred passata and things like that for pasta sauce if I don't have fresh tomatoes to use and I use the fresh tomatoes mainly for things like salsa, pico de gallo, um, some cherry tomatoes in olive oil like a, like a tomato confit and things like that uh, so we only had one jar of salsa left on the shelf. We decided to that that would be the best use of these tomatoes So let me bring you along and see how we put it all together All right, so I go very very simple with my salsa. I use the tomatoes. I don't peel them. I don't uh, deceive them or anything like that all I do is I cut the main large core out of the tomato and then the rest of it goes in the thermomix and then in the thermomix I turbo it a couple of times so it's unevenly uh, broken up there's lots of little bits a couple of big bits bits of skin bits that haven't got skin all that sort of thing and I think it really lends to the salsa because it keeps the salsa tasting really fresh what we were really surprised about with that with the salsa was that uh, the the jars you open the jars and it doesn't taste cooked at all it tastes really fresh and tangy and like you've just sliced up tomatoes and made salsa so by doing it this way I think that that really helps by leaving the skin on to give it a little bit of crispness uh, and keep, keep that fresh going so all I do as I said is I cut out the main big core and then I put them in the thermix and I turbo them for two seconds twice so that they're all sort of broken up uh, I did all that, did the whole box, did them in groups of however many fit in the jug and things like that. And I ended up at the end with around about 30 cups of the diced tomato or crushed tomato or whatever you want to call it. So the the box gave me, I don't know what the box weighed, I didn't weigh it, uh, but it gave me about 30 cups of the diced tomatoes. Now for that quantity, I used two really large onions. You can use onions or you can use uh, spring onions or anything like that. Uh, I like I tend to just use standard brown onions because that's what I always have. So I use two really large onions for that quantity and two small heads of garlic. So I want to say that you could use a large clove of garlic per five cups, maybe. So maybe six ish decent size had decent sized cloves of garlic in here but I used our homegrown garlic and it was all quite small so I just used two full heads there was probably 15 cloves but they were really tiny cloves and two really large onions is what I felt was a, a good sort of an amount there I did add chilies but for some reason I haven't turned the camera on for it so I used homegrown chilies that I had left in the fridge so I had the argy pineapples and the jalapenos uh, and the jalapenos were really small so I used 15 all up so I used one per two cups of diced tomatoes around about but they were really small the argy pineapple don't have a huge amount of heat to them but they have some lovely flavor and I didn't de-seed them or take the membrane or anything out all I did was throw them in the thermomix and mince them up the same as I did with the tomatoes and the onions and things like that once everything was diced up added it all to the pot now my pot this is the largest pot I have and it's a bit small for this batch so I pulled some of the solids out just so that I had more room to add the liquid to and then fixed it all up later so I pulled some of the solids out to start with and then I added apple cider vinegar now I use about half a cup of apple cider vinegar per about five cups of diced tomatoes it's a little on the generous side of vinegar but it also means that I don't have to be as careful measuring out my onions and my garlic and things like that. So uh, it compensates for that a little bit. So the 
and they were also field tomatoes in a box so you don't really know the acidity of your tomatoes either for that in that sense either so i was a little generous on the apple cider vinegar and i did half a cup per about five cups of diced tomatoes i added a few teaspoons of salt i just did a squeeze 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 of the salt and tasted it afterwards and was happy with the flavor of it uh, and then I added around about a tablespoon of lemon juice per five cups as well. I don't think I showed it. I think I must have again not hit the record on the camera. But I used bottled lemon juice because I, and I would prefer to use lime juice, but I didn't have any frozen. I do have chunks of lime in the freezer and I did consider adding it and then pulling out the rind afterwards. But I wasn't sure if that would leave a bit of bitterness behind that I wasn't real pleased with. So in the end, I just used bottled lemon juice, but that's personal preference. I prefer lime juice around about a tablespoon per five cups of tomatoes. Once everything was in the pot there, well, I still had the excess out. So when I dice my tomatoes, I don't, I don't de-seed them or anything else like that, which means that I end up with a lot of liquid. Uh, a lot of people will press their tomatoes or they take the seeds out which takes a lot of liquid out but I don't do that so I end up with a lot of excess liquid so what I did was I put it in the pot and then as it's in the pot I used a ladle and I pulled some of the liquid out uh, just enough to be able to get all of the solids in there so the liquid from the tomatoes is what I'm looking to pull out obviously you're going to be pulling out a little bit of the vinegar and stuff like that and I probably should have pulled the tomato liquid out before adding all the vinegars and stuff in there but I didn't think about it at the time so all I did was I pulled some of the liquid out so I could get all the solids into that pot again I've been generous with the vinegar so realistically this is probably uh, fine because of that but if I did it again I would try and remember to pull the tomato liquid out before adding the other ingredients back in there adding the vinegars and things like that I uh, didn't think about it until right now when I was just discussing it that yes I probably should have pulled that liquid that tomato water out prior to adding the vinegars anyway uh, nobody could find uh, so you need to bring that pot up to a boil so you bring it up to a boil and then turn it straight down to a simmer and you want to simmer it for about 15 minutes and most of this is just so that the uh, air and stuff is out of your tomatoes so that you can get more in the jars without any floating and things like that less liquid in your jars more solids and all that sort of thing Nobody could find the funnel that I use for this size jars uh, that have narrower necks on them, of course. So I had to improvise with a jar a funnel that really doesn't fit inside the jars, which I meant I made a lot of mess. So what I tend to do is I use a slotted, a big slotted spoon to pull all the solids out to put into these jars so that the jars are mostly solids without the liquid to, to begin with. Uh, so I use a slotted spoon to pull all the salsa out and put it in these jars and that way when I open those jars of salsa it's chunky salsa it's not watery so I'm trying to use a slotted spoon the wrong size funnel into jars you can't see where the jars are filled up to because the funnel doesn't fit inside anyway it was it was messy <laughs> uh, and I am on the lookout for my other funnel that has the narrower mouth on it but for the moment we did what we had to do and we filled them all in a storm did roll in the whole time I was doing this too, which made it all just more challenging because the roof leaks in the uh, in the kitchen and stuff behind the bench and things like that. And uh, it's just unpleasant to be out here in a storm. It's it's not, yeah. Eventually it'll be alright, but for the moment it's a little bit of a pain in the bum. So uh, once the Once the jars were filled with solids, we put the lids on them. So I'm using a mix of supermarket jars here. These are all just reused jars. Some of them are tomato paste. Some of them are jam jars. Some of them are, I think there's a couple of molasses jars in there as well, perhaps. Uh, a range of supermarket jars. And they have a few different size lids. So the squat jam jars have an 82 mil lid. The standard sort of molasses jars and that, the 500 mil ish jars, have a 63 mil lid, and there is also a tomato paste jar, it's a Legos one that has a 70 mil lid. So I used a combination of good uh, secondhand lids that I could find, as well as some brand new ones. So I ordered brand new ones recently and have a whole selection of brand new ones, but I do like to try and reuse lids if I've got some that are in good condition. Uh, but it was just a mix of whatever whatever I had that was in the right condition for the right jars that I was using. 
you have to clean the rims really well with vinegar especially when you're using a poorly sized funnel like I was because you've got little bits of tomato that are around the edges so you want to make sure that you clean any solids off the edges of those that's going to interfere with the twist lid going on so you want to make sure you clean the sur the top surface because that's what's going to hit the silicon on the inside of the, or the rubber or whatever it's made out of on the inside of the twist jar lid but you also want to clean the rims to make sure that there's nothing interfering with the way the lid twists on so clean them really well with vinegar to make sure that you haven't got any solids or anything on the rims of the jars. I also wiped the inside of the lids with vinegar as I was using them, which I've said on most of my canning videos, we live in a dusty, dirty place and I just like to give them a wipe with vinegar before I place them on the top as well. Uh, the twist lids, unlike a ball mason jar where you want to just do the ring finger tight, you have to put your twist lids on nice and firm you need to put them on as firm as you can so whole hand twist them on so they're nice and secure and you'll find that sometimes you get a few that you try and do it and it's like if you then you put them down but if you just twist the jar back the, the lid back the other way they just come off again you need to make sure that it's not like that you want them to be on nice and firm once the jars were all the rims were all clean the lids were all on the jars they need to go in the canner now the product in the jars is hot so as we've discussed hot product in the jar means you need to go into hot water when you're canning it uh, so same temperature in the jars same temperature in the canner that's what you need to do so you don't risk any shock when the glasses hit the when the glass jars hit the temperature so we i filled up the canner and put it on heat to warm up the water i filled it generously because we're doing water bath canning which means that you need the water to be an inch and a half to two inches above the height of the last jar so that they are completely covered the whole time they are processing now i canned up all that liquid as well because that liquid is tomato juice basically it's a diluted tomato juice a few bits of solids things like that so i grabbed one liter ghee jars to put that in because i will use it for a myriad of things it could be used in a chili it could be used in a spaghetti sauce it could be used in a bunch of things it's tomatoes onion garlic and a bit of chili and that's it so it's going to make a great liquid to add to things instead of adding water so I just grabbed some ghee jars, which are one liter jars. They have an 82 mil lid and I filled them up as well. Now, because I did that and I wasn't intending to originally, I had been going to double stack in my canner, but the once I put the ghee jars in there and put the second uh, rack in there, I realized that it was gonna end up too tall. Uh, I wasn't gonna be able to maintain the water level that was required to keep it above the jars. So I decided to pull my steam canner out as well and run it at the same time and thinking about it once I did that, I probably should have just done it all in the steam canner, just done two or three batches in the steam canner. It probably would have been quicker in the end anyway, and less water. But that's life. So I used the excess hot water that was in the boiling water bath canner to put into the steam canner. So you need to fill it up to the tray uh, and topped that up with the hot water. Both canners are the same principles. They're both ha run by the same water bath canning style principles the steam canner has a a um a dial on the top and for me it needs to get to the dark green for our altitude so you want to get it to the dark green before you start the timer the water bath canner the water has to be at a rolling boil before you start the timer and then each one is processing for 20 minutes so the steam canner got to dark green and i started the timer and about 10 minutes later the water bath canner hit rolling boil and I started the timer on that one as well so there it took about 10 minutes more for the water bath canner to get to a rolling boil which is why the steam canner can be so much more efficient to use because there's so much less water it takes a lot less time for it to get up to where it needs to go uh, so anyway they it was only about 10 minutes difference between the two so it wasn't too bad uh, 20 minute processing time for those and then once they were done I let them sit for five minutes until the the steam came down a little bit and the there was no bubbling in the water because it's it's awkward to pull them out you don't want to let it go cold in there but you do it is nice to leave it for just a little bit to make it a little bit easier to handle once they were done I moved them all onto a board like normal so all those jars need to go on a board for 24 hours before the seals can be tested so they go on the board and left alone even if they don't look like they've sealed at this point in time it doesn't mean they aren't sealed so you want to just leave them alone completely for 24 hours and then after 24 hours that's when you check the lids with twist lids some of these secondhand lids had pop tops in the middle so you can tell if they're sealed because the pop top 
goes concave but the ones that don't have the little pops in the middle they still go concave so the easiest way to tell it is to put a pencil across the top of the jar and if you can see daylight under the pencil then that lid is concave and that's sealed so that's the easiest way to check you can also tap on the middle of the lid there is a distinct sound difference between one that is concave and sealed than one that hasn't sealed there is a, a hollowness to it it's, a, it's a, a deeper sound on a sealed one and a sort of a hollow sound on a non-sealed one so there's quite a few ways to check those jars if they're sealed you just you can tell once you've done it a few times but there are those methods for helping you to do that something straight across the top a chopstick a pencil something like that if you can see daylight underneath it then it's it's sealed because it's concave uh, and then general rule of thumb for anything you pull off a shelf if you pull it out and when you open the lid it doesn't go pop or hiss then obviously there was something wrong with the seal so if it is a product like a jam or a salsa or something like that generally speaking they'll go moldy if they're not sealed properly so you'll it'll be visible that there's something wrong with it uh, if it's a meat or something we just don't use it because if there's no sound of seal botulism is invisible so you don't want to risk something if it's not sealed uh, the but anything like a jam and things like that generally speaking they'll be mold you'll be able to see it as to that the seal is impacted uh, so the next day we just double check the lids make sure that everything looks sealed do a tap test do a stick test whatever you feel the need to do to make yourself comfortable with putting them on the shelves wash the jars down label them and stick them on the shelf so that is salsa for us for quite a while we don't eat it in huge amounts uh, but it is definitely something that we really enjoy having on the shelf uh, and maybe if we got more tomatoes more often we'd use it more perhaps but we obviously no tomatoes in the garden no chilies in the garden things like that so we're relying on whatever i can get from elsewhere and that's i was because we only shop every six to eight weeks that makes it hard so that is how i do my salsa extraordinarily simple uh very bare minimum ingredients bare minimum cooking but we find that when you crack open a jar and put it in a bowl it is like eating something that's just been diced up right then and there it is super fresh super crunchy and just tastes like it's fresh it doesn't taste like it's cooked so we have been really enjoying it and we like it just sitting there with a bowl with corn chips to be honest so that's how we do it so thank you for joining me again today and as per usual any questions and comments uh, feel free and I am no expert in canning this is just how I have learnt to do it over time and my comfort levels and of course everyone's kitchen is their own kitchen and you need to assess what your comfort levels are with things as well and do things that suit you remember to can things that you eat too that's you know you don't want to be canning something that you're not going to eat so thank you for joining me again today and i will see you next time